to talk more about this from the American Enterprise Institute, Middle East expert Michael Rubin. Michael, we thank you for the time. Thanks for Skyping in from Washington. Uh, Michael, what do you make of the discrepancy between President Obama's words and his subsequent actions? By that I mean boots on the ground in any form, including embassy protection. Well, we've always had embassy protection in Baghdad. President Obama is simply supplementing that, but make no mistake, if President Obama thinks that is going to be enough to give the image of doing something, he's sadly mistaken. The embassy is behind four layers of, of blast walls. It's an island of just a couple square kilometers. There's no way that those boots on the ground are going to do anything to change or impact in any way the Iraqi situation. Michael, yesterday on our program, my old uh, congressional colleague, uh, House Intelligence Committee Chairman Mike Rogers, actually had a plea for our Commander-in-Chief. Take a listen to what Chairman Rogers had to say. Mr. President, please come back from the golf course. We need you. We need a decision now. We need to sit down. We ought to be spending very long days in situation rooms in the basement, in the intel space at the capitals to try to get through a place that really, really does work for uh, American national security interests, and they're at stake. So we, we take a look at the situation, Michael. Uh, the president in Palm Springs over the weekend, when everything was unraveling in Iraq, what message does it send to the, le the rest of the world when you have the president pursuing leisure activities when a crisis is unfolding as one is now in Iraq? Well, it sends to our allies the image that the United States doesn't it simply doesn't care, and that's the wrong message to send. Remember, what happens in Iraq doesn't stay in Iraq. The nightmare situation, there's two nightmare situations. Number one, that after creating, after transforming Iraq into Syria 2.0, ISIS is going to set its sight on the Hashemite Kingdom of Jordan, a stable U.S. ally. Should Jordan fall, that changes the Middle East uh, completely in a way we haven't seen in decades. The other nightmare situation is that ISIS manages to blow up one of the Shiite shrines. That's not only going to send Iraq aflame, that's going to send the whole Middle East aflame. Remember, Saudi Arabia produces its oil in its eastern province, which is populated by the Shiites. You don't want that area on fire. Yeah, it'd, hard to, it'd be hard to think what would happen if there was Shuni Shia, uh, Shia violence in Saudi Arabia as well. But, Mike, I wanted to ask you, we're getting conflicting reports. Uh, what's going on, actually, on the ground in Iraq? We hear... Uh, when ISIS released information, they're saying they're killing 1,700 Iraqi police and security forces. When the, you hear from the Iraqi government, it's only 170. But from what you're hearing, what is your assessment of what's taking place on the ground right now and, and the Shia militiamen and the Iraqi forces? How are they doing, at least in the last couple of days, trying to push back against ISIS without U.S. help? Well, we shouldn't be more sectarian than the Iraqis. We tend to think about what's going on in Sunni versus Shiite terms. But remember, most of the people who are getting executed, most of the people who have been killed in Mosul by ISIS have been Sunnis being killed by Sunnis. Okay. The closer that ISIS gets to Baghdad, the more resistance they're going to face because Baghdad is majority Shiite. They know they can't simply surrender because they will be executed. Therefore, ISIS is hitting that brick wall where they are going to have a fight. The Iraqi army, well, we shouldn't think of it as an army. It's a patchwork of militias, but they are capable of defeating ISIS. You know, in November 2004, there was an uprising in Mosul. The insurgents won the city. The Americans at that point helped put it down. But instead of having shock and awe now, what we're going to see is Stalingrad. Well, you, you talk about what is transpiring in Mosul as if a, a war of attrition, and especially as they head into Baghdad. But, but I'm wondering in the broader geopolitical construct, Michael, yesterday we heard from Secretary of State Kerry that talks were going to begin with Iraq, that a... I guess it, we shouldn't technically call it an alliance, but that somehow the United States and Iran could be working together in Iraq. From your viewpoint, is this sound foreign policy strategy or is this another crisis in the making? Let me put it this way. The United States and Iran have mutual interest in Iraq, but the way I tend to look at it is firemen and arsonists have mutual interests in a fire. Just because we have mutual interest in a subject doesn't mean we're looking at it the same way. God forbid Secretary John Kerry blesses Iran's entrance into Iraq. The problem isn't getting Iran into Iraq. The problem is getting them out. 
And if you want any evidence for that, just look at Lebanon, where Hezbollah has been terrorizing that state for 32 years, including 14 years after the withdrawal of Israel from southern Lebanon. And Michael, yesterday we've, we, we had some guests on here, and, and Patrick, Patrick Buchanan said maybe the only option here is splitting Iraq up into different countries. Do you see that as the only long-term uh, solution here or, or an inevitable uh, result of what's happening right now, where you see Iraq split into two different countries and then Kurdistan as well in the north? Well, here's the problem. When people talk about a tripartite division of Iraq, does that mean that you're going to cede the Sunni areas to ISIS? Are you effectively going to bless the creation of a terrorist safe haven? Unfortunately, the division of Iraq isn't going to resolve this problem. The fact of the matter is we face this terrorist threat. It's not a threat based on grievance. It's a threat based on ideology. And Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi has made clear his goal isn't Baghdad. It's New York City. You mentioned al-Baghdadi and the account that appeared on our parent website, Newsmax.com, when he told his previous captors upon his release from detention camp, quote, I'll see you guys in New York. And now, even though you outlined uh, or cautioned us not to look at this as a traditional uh, Shia versus Sunni conflict, at least not at the outset, the whole notion of nation states being set aside and uh, the, the concept of the rise of the caliphate uh, comes to mind because, correct me if I'm wrong, Michael, but as I understand it, as Chairman Rogers put it the other day, essentially ISIS controls an area right now geographically the size of the state of Indiana. But it, there is real concern that this becomes the geographic center of an ever-expanding modern caliphate. How how uh, realistic is that uh, fear? It's a very realistic fear. This is my main problem with the Obama administration and its policy on terrorism. It sees terrorism as motivated by grievance, and therefore it believes that if only you give enough incentives, if only you, you basically bribe the terrorists, the terrorism will go away. The problem is ideology. They want to construct this caliphate, and no matter how many incentives you give them, they're just pocket them and continue on their way. This is one of the reasons why I'm at, uncomfortable simply blaming Prime Minister Maliki, because whether the, the al-Qaeda guys or ISIS likes Maliki or not, it's not going to change uh, their commitment to terror. Michael, we also need to talk about uh, the expanding picture of terror geopolitically. Al-Shabaab, this, this group claiming responsibility for attacks in Kenya that killed 48, is this a sign that these Islamo terror factions around the globe are strengthening? Uh, absolutely, they're strengthening. You know, when President Obama about two weeks ago had a bunch of left of center journalists at the White House, I went through the list, and with two exceptions, all of them had said Al Qaeda is dead. That's what President Obama wanted to hear. That's why he invited them for lunch. If I wanted a free lunch at the White House, I would say Al Qaeda is dead, pass the potatoes. But ultimately, it's not enough for the president to surround himself with people who tell him what he wants to hear. Sycophancy undercuts national security. We need to recognize we have a real problem. It's a global problem. The way to think about Islamist terrorists isn't as individual national insurgencies, but actually as an international trans-border insurgency. So as we review the situation right now, and we began in Iraq and military involvement, Given the, the on-again, off-again, back and forth, in the final analysis, and we have about a minute left, Michael, do you expect Mr. Obama as Commander-in-Chief to take further military steps uh, in Iraq to stave off the rise of ISIS, or where will we hear a lot of talk and no action? It's going to be all talk, no action. Obama has never understood that American military power is the finger in the dike preventing the deluge of chaos and whether it's in the Middle East, whether it's in Crimea, whether it's in the South China Sea, it's always the same thing. He doesn't understand a strong military is essential to international peace. Michael Rubin, we thank you for your insights, thank and you. we will be back in touch with you in the not-too-distant future on these matters of concern. You know, John, it's interesting. And, of course, Michael's book, Dancing with the Devil, talks about some of these alliances. He made no bones mentioning about the danger of coordinating things with Iran. Mm. Interesting he would use the term finger in the dike because, as it turns out, our friend Peter Hoekstra will join us from the Netherlands as we get our daily intel brief. That's up next on America's Forum. Stay tuned.